Good evening, everyone. My name's Simon. I'm one of the ministers here, and I'm thrilled to uh, have this opportunity to share with you on this wonderful occasion. Recently, I was walking into work down Botley Road when I heard the sound of bongo drums. It was about eight o'clock in the morning. This was an unusual thing to hear. And I turned, and there was a chap in a colorful shell suit with a rainbow sweater and a bowler hat with feathers sticking out. And he was bongoing away, if there is a verb for bongoing. Anyway, he walked past me, and as he walked past me, I saw uh, on his back that there was this large embroidered image of a bongo drum, and there, written across it, it said, bongo for world peace. Bongo for world peace. And I thought, good effort. I like that. Uh, I like the bongos. My son, Nathaniel, is a bongoer, and uh, he's actually playing at a carol service down in Bournemouth, even as I speak. But I thought, I wonder whether that's going to work. Are the bongos going to do the job? The fact is, seriously, we do need world peace. We need peace in our world. We need peace in our time. We need peace in our relationships. We need peace in our lives, peace in our minds. But where are we going to find it? We've been through a really tough time the last couple of years. And in the last few months, we've seen uh, England facing a real political instability and uh, looking at economic bankruptcy. But when we look internationally, we've seen dark storm clouds <laughs> gathering uh, in Ukraine with Russia's illegal and immoral invasion of it. As we were rehearsing this afternoon at four o'clock, a group of Ukrainians asked if they could come in and just sit in the church. They sat at the back, the choir were rehearsing, and they sat there in tears, and I spoke to them. They were all from Mariupol, and they've seen their homes destroyed and their people killed. There is a great need for peace in our life and in our lands. Global and political and financial turmoil on the one hand is echoed by a kind of internal and emotional and existential and mental turmoil. And many of us are not really coping well, not coping with the stress and strain and being stretched by this all. Again, today I've had three conversations with people, all who are suffering real mental illness at this time. And how many of us in here uh, understand exactly what that's like to have our minds being stretched to the limit. I think many of us will sing the carol from experience this year. In the bleak midwinter, frosty wind made moan, earth stood hard as iron. Certainly that's how it seems. How we need peace. But how are we going to find peace? How are we going to get peace? I read one self-help writer a week ago who offers her top tips for peace at Christmas. I thought this is going to be good. I might nick it for my sermon. At number one, recite a Christmas mantra like, I will keep Christmas in my heart. I thought, oh, Dickens and Scrooge, you'd appreciate that, but is that going to work? Add some fun to your Christmas chores and clean the house singing Christmas songs loudly. Hands up if you think that's going to work. I'm not, I can't see whether you put your hands up. It's black as far as I can see out there. Another one was set aside five minutes each morning to sit quietly with a cup of Christmas blend coffee and just breathe. Again, I thought, like the bongo, or I thought, good effort, but is that all you've got to offer? I'm not sure that's going to work. I need more than that. We need more than that. One TV Christmas advert this year was about Toby the turkey. 
escaping an abattoir. Any of you saw that? And it claims, quote, peace on earth begins at home, have a vegan Christmas. (laughs) Before I became a priest 30 years ago, I was a butcher. (laughs) And I struggle, I gotta be honest, I actually married a vegetarian and she'd be very happy with that, but not this year, I'm afraid. (laughs) But again, I think, good effort, but is that gonna work? I mean, serious needs require serious solutions. To have peace on earth, we need the peace of heaven to come to earth. And that's what Christmas is all about. And that's what this evening, in all that we hear read and said and sung, will tell us. Around the time of the birth of Jesus, everyone was talking about peace on earth. It was a theme. Poems were being written about the peace on earth that had been brought by Caesar Augustus. It was called Pax Romana. And what it meant was that Rome had literally suppressed all her enemies at the point of a sword. And one brilliant philosopher, a Stoic, father of Stoic and Cynic philosophy, Epictetus, that was a bit of Oxford for you, said, while the emperor may give peace from war on land and sea, he is unable to give peace from passion, grief, and envy. He cannot even give peace of the heart for which humankind yearns far more than outward peace. And how right he was to see that. Caesar couldn't give that. Political stability, perhaps, but peace on the inside and peace with God. Epictetus couldn't offer any good solution. He could only observe and analyze. He said, actually, the best we can do is que sera, sera, have a mindset that says, this is how it is, and we ain't going to change it. He's the father of cynic philosophy. But 700 years before Jesus, the prophet Isaiah saw and declared, he said, for to us a child is born and to us a son is given and the government shall be on his shoulders and his name will be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And the prophet Isaiah saw that one would come from God, who was God, to be with us. A child born in time, in space, in our world, in a place, but a child who was a son given from all eternity, God's eternal son. The one who created the universe, contracted to a span, wed to human blood in virgin's womb. And he was born with a purpose. Mighty God, wonderful counselor, everlasting father to bring the peace of heaven on earth. God didn't send a therapist or an economist or a general or a philosopher or a politician. We got a lot of them. What we needed was God himself to come to the rescue. And Isaiah says twice, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Twice he underlines that, to us, to us. God came for us. He's not ignorant of us. He's not unaware of us. He's not indifferent to us. He came for us. Jesus is born with your name tag. He is born as a gift for you to bring you peace. The Oxford academic and author of Narnia, C.S. Lewis, wrote, God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself. He says there is no such thing. And the wonderful thing is that God does give himself In Christ Jesus, God gave himself that first Christmas to us to bring peace. 
So peace on earth and mercy mild, as we will sing shortly, comes when God and sinners are reconciled. That's what we sing, and that is the truth we understand as Christians. Peace comes as we welcome God's Prince of Peace and receive the government that's on his shoulders and his wonderful counsel and his might and his heavenly eternal fathering. You know, the theme of peace accompanies Jesus all his ministry. Right from the start at his birth, there's an amazing scene. The angels are so full and overcome with wonder at what is taking place with the birth of God in flesh in Bethlehem that they tumble out of heaven and freak out a load of uh, shepherds watching over the sheep. They haven't got much peace when that happens. Angels do. And what do they say? Peace. Goodwill to all people. Some of us think God's against us, but actually he's the one who comes saying peace and goodwill to us. Jesus brought peace to the fear-filled disciples in a storm-tossed boat. And as the waves crashed all around, some of you may feel that that's how it is in your life at the moment, Jesus came and said, peace, be still. And the wind and the waves and the storms and the sea obey him still. Jesus came and brought peace to the tormented man, tormented in his mind and body, the man of Gadara. And with a word, he set him free and brought peace. He's still doing that, setting people free. He brought peace to the shame-filled woman caught in adultery and he declared forgiveness. He says, I don't condemn you, but go and pack it in. And Jesus brought peace to the tax collector Zacchaeus who had accumulated great wealth and yet the great wealth brought him no peace. He just felt the weight of his injustice ripping off his own people and Jesus came and graced him and transformed him and brought him salvation. You know, hours before his arrest, at his last supper, Jesus gave a commentary on what would ensue when he went to the cross. He said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. And that peace is what he purchased by going into the heart of darkness at Calvary. Jesus is born to die. He's a, he was a babe on a mission. It was said, crib and cross, crib and cross are made of the same wood. Born to die, because only in dying can he expunge evil, can he wipe away the wrongdoing in the world, can he destroy the demonic, can he open up the way for us to God. And Jesus, who is God and man in one, there at the cross is God for man and man for God and he reaches out his arms and in himself brings us together. Peace on earth and mercy mild, yes, when God and sinners are reconciled through the Prince of Peace at that place of horror at Calvary. And when we say yes to Jesus, when we invite him into our lives, when we welcome him, as it were, to be born in the stable of our lives, to lay his head in that meager manger of our soul, then he brings the peace of God, the mighty God, the wonderful counsel, the everlasting Father. I need to finish. I read this week about the Hollywood actor Matthew Perry some of you who are old enough will remember him. He was a star. He is a star. And he played Chandler in that great series, Friends, in the 90s. Anyone remember that? Not on the front row, probably. He's just released a very honest autobiography. Not a religious man. He says that the first prayer he ever prayed was to ask God to make him famous. And that worked. And that ruined him. And... Uh, a multi-millionaire, but no peace. Fame and fortune, but no happiness. He became an opiate addict and an alcoholic. He said he had tormented years, 14 stints in rehab, 15 stomach surgeries, over 60 attempts at detox. And a couple of years ago, he hit rock bottom. 
and he had nowhere else to go and nowhere else to turn. The fame, the fortune, that had actually helped rob him of his happiness. And he says that he called out to God, this only second prayer ever, and he called out to God in desperation, and he said, God, please help me. Show me that you're here. God, help me. And he said, immediately, God came. A light filled the room. And he says this, I started to cry. I mean, I really started to cry. That shoulder-shaking kind of uncontrollable weeping. I wasn't crying because I was sad. I was crying because for the first time in my life, I felt okay. I felt safe and taken care of. And decades of struggling with God and wrestling with life and sadness were all washed away like a river of pain gone into oblivion. Called out to God. God heard. God listened. God responded. God came. God entered his life, that meager manger of his soul, and set him free. God did what no one else could do. That's what God does. Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And he wants to come into our lives. He entered our world two millennia ago. And he wants to enter our lives now. And he wants to bring his peace. Amen.